Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So in the last lecture, we were discussing about perquisites. Now let's do some retirement benefits because from examination point of view, these retirement benefits are, are, are also very important, especially provident fund uh, because this is provident fund is one of the favorite for examiner. He keeps on asking provisions or questions on this provident fund. So what all we should do in uh, retirement benefits? First, we'll talk about gratuity, how you tax gratuity. If it is provided at the time of retirement, then we understand some amount is exempt. If it is government employee, then it is fully exempt. If it is non-government employee pay covered under gratuity act or not covered under gratuity act, you should know the provisions. Second thing, we will do pension, then leave salary. Again, leave salary is also important. Voluntary retirement scheme, retrenchment compensation, Although these two are not very important, generally we don't see questions coming on this provision VRS and, and retrenchment compensation, but still you should have a fair idea how we'll be taxing this amount. Then provident fund, as I was already discussing, provident fund is uh, again favorite, uh, examiner's favorite. There is one more thing, Agnivir Corpus Fund, which has been introduced now. So you should know how to deal with it. If uh, uh, it's a scheme which has come out for, for in the field of defense that um, the youth who are from the age of uh, 17 to 20, they can join as an Agni Veer. They have to pass an examination. They can um, join as an Agni Veer as a soldier. They will serve for five years. So what is this scheme all about? And there is also a deduction ATCCH, ATCCH1, ATCCH2, which has been introduced. That we'll also be discussing, although that we will be give, uh, discussing in detail in the chapter of deductions, right? And then finally, we will do relief under section 89. Very easy to compute why we are giving this relief and how we will compute it. Okay, should we start now? Let's start with first gratuity. So if you will see, taxability of gratuity, first of all, understand one thing. If you are getting this gratuity during the tenure of your job, not at the time of retirement, but regular, you keep on getting this gratuity regularly, let's say every year. So if you're getting this gratuity at the, during the tenure of your job, during the continuity of service, then such gratuity is fully taxable. Let's say your employer gives you gratuity of rupees 50,000 every year. So whatever he is giving you every year, that is during the continuity of service, that amount is fully taxable. Either that employee is a government employee or non-government employee, that is irrelevant. If you are getting gratuity during the term of your employment, during the tenure of your employment, during the continuity of service, fully taxable. Got it? So if this gratuity is received during the continuity of service, fully taxable. Whereas if employee receives such gratuity at the time when he is leaving that organization, why he's leaving? Might be he is retiring from that organization. Might be uh, he's getting terminated or resigning. Any, um, it could be any scenario. But the thing is that when he's leaving, he or she is leaving that organization at the time, at that time, if the person is getting gratuity, that could be exempt, right? So gratuity received at the time of retirement, resignation, termination, and so on, we can say that this person is leaving the organization. In that case, this gratuity could be exempt up to a certain limit. How much is exempt? We should know. First of all, first see the person who is receiving this gratuity, the employee, whether that employee is a government employee or not. Here, government employee means central government employee, state government employee, or even local authority employee. So if that employee is a government employee, central government, state government, or local authority, if that person is receiving at the time of retirement, resignation, termination, etc., then it will be fully exempt. I'm again repeating, if this person is a government employee, but that person is receiving the gratuity during the continuity of service, that is regular gratuity almost, then it would be taxable. But if this person is getting gratuity at the time when this person is leaving the organization, then it will be exempt. Got it? Okay. So we understand at the time of retirement, resignation, etc., government employee fully exempt. For non-government employee, we have to see whether that organization is covered under Payment of Gratuity Act or not, right? So if it will be mentioned in the question, they will always they always mentions that whether the employee is covered under Gratuity Act or not. 
if the person is covered under gravity act then we have to give this much deduction whatever is the least if the person is not covered under gravity act then we will give this deduction whichever is the lower amount least amount right so let's understand that this person is a non government employee let's say if it is mentioned in the question that this person is covered under gravity act i tell you and um, every time whenever this question is asked on gravity they always mention institute always mention in the question that whether the person is covered under gravity act or not covered under gravity act but let's say in our examination questions come and they mention that this person is a non government employee but they are silent about whether they are covered under payment of gratuity act or not covered under gratuity act if the question is silent then you can make your own assumption and you can proceed you can either assume cover that person is covered under, under gratuity act and you can give this particular you can apply this provision or you can also assume that this person is not covered under, under gratuity act and you can apply these provisions right so if the question is silent although it has never happened before and i don't believe i i didn't believe that it will be in future also but still if if it happens then you can apply your own assumptions and proceed and please mention your assumption that it is assumed that we are assuming that this person is covered or you can say we are assuming this person is not covered right but i would recommend if you are assuming then please assume that this pay, this person is covered under payment of gratuity act because practically speaking most of the organizations are covered under gratuity act so this is a better assumption practically so i recommend if you are assuming then assume this one right okay otherwise if you will even if assume this one examiner will accept your assumption and they will provide you marks also right okay so if the person is a non government employee and this person is covered under gratuity act then least of the following would be accepted what is the uh, these three conditions first is actual gratuity received let's say the person is receiving 12 lakh rupees as gratuity so 12 lakh is the actual gratuity second is rupees 20 lakh is a fixed limit not 10 lakh it's 20 lakh rupees as the fixed statutory limit actual gratuity 20 lakh rupees third is third is something which you have to learn 15 by 26 15 by 26 it is almost equal to half but you have to take 15 by 26 generally it is uh, half why i'm saying half because generally in a month there are 30 days there are 30 days and if i take out of 15 out of it that is half of the month so 15 by 30 but they have excluded sundays or non working days from here so let us assume that there are four sundays in a month so they have deducted four sundays out of it that is the reason it is coming 15 by 26 right this is 15 by 26 but you just have to learn this this is something which you have to learn 15 by 26 into last drawn salary into completed year of service or part thereof in excess of 6 months let me repeat it once again the third point is 15 by 26 into last drawn salary what is last drawn salary in this salary you will only include basic salary and da da forming part no and that da you will include basic salary and da so what is last drawn salary when his person is getting retired what was the last salary which he has drawn this is called last drawn salary so let me give you an example let's say if this person is getting retired on the last day of the month last day of the month this person is getting retired he has served this entire month and then he is getting retired so let's say this person is getting retired on 31st october 2023 let's say examiner will give you that this person got retired on 31st march october 2023 it means that he has served for this month also right this month salary he has drawn so you will take last drawn salary you will you can take of october month itself right not of september no october month is okay because he has worked for the entire month so this is the last month salary right so if the person is the thumb rule is that if the person is retiring on the last day of the month you can take that month itself you can take that month itself that is the last drawn salary but let's say if the person gets retired in between somewhere let's say between the month let's say he get, gets retired on 10th of october or 12th of october that is somewhere in between then you have to take the last drawn salary as a normal salary so in october you cannot take october salary because he has worked only for 10 days so in that case you should go to the previous month that is september 
right? So the thumb rule is if the person is getting retired on the last day of the month, please take that month's salary itself. If the person is retiring somewhere in between, then you can go to the preceding month, right? So 15 by 26, uh, it would be 15 by 26 into last drawn salary into completed year of service or part thereof in excess of six months. You understand if the uh, person has worked there for 15 years and seven months, this is in excess of six months. So you can round it off to 16 years. You will take at 16. But if this person has worked for uh, 15 years, six months or less than six months, then you will ignore that part and only 15 years you will take. So this, they are saying in excess of six months, if it is coming in excess of six months, then you have to go to the next number. Otherwise, just um, ignore that partial month, or partial month or partial year and only take the completed years, right? So I'm again repeating, if the person is covered under gratuity, is a non if the person is a government employee, then there is no problem. Uh, whatever gratuity has received, make it fully exempt. But if the person is not government employee and covered under gratuity act, actual gratuity received 20 lakh, please remember 20 lakhs is the fixed limit. And third is, 15 by 26 into last drawn salary, last drawn salary components are basic salary and DA overhead. DA forming part? No, entire DA. Okay, into complete year of service or part thereof in excess of six months. If this, this person is not covered under payment of gratuity, so these two points are same, actual gratuity received and 20 lakh rupees are same. Third has a little change. It says one by two. Here it was saying 15 by 26, almost that was also one by two, but here you have to take only 15 by 26. Here you are taking one by two, one by two into average salary into only completed year of service. So here, if uh, that person has worked for 15 years, 11 months, then you have to ignore this 11 months, only take 15 years, only take 15 years, only completed years should be taken. Average salary, here salary means basic salary, DA forming part of retirement benefits and fixed percentage commission on turnover, the same components of salary which we take in uh, your HRA exemption, right? So what is the name I have given uh, to that particular components? RBS, retirement benefit salary. So here you will be taking retirement benefit salary which comprises of basic salary, DA forming part, fixed percentage commission on turnover. Only that commission should be, uh, should be included over here. That is a fixed percentage on turnover, right? And average salary here means you have to take the average of the last 10 months of so the last 10 months you have to take the average okay one important thing is that this 20 lakh rupees limit is the statutory limit and it is a lifetime limit so let's say if this person was working with some other company earlier with other company earlier he has worked for 10 years and he got retired from that company and he got a gratuity also from that company and at that time when he was retired from his previous employer he has taken an exemption of let's say 3 lakh rupees right and now he has started working in some other company in some other company he worked for 20 years and now he is getting retired and his employer is paying him gratuity also so this limit of 20 lakh because this was a lifetime limit and already earlier we have received gratuity from some other employer and we have claimed exemption also let's say the exemption claimed earlier was 3 lakh then this limit will be reduced by that exemption which we have already claimed earlier so we have claimed, let's say for 3 lakh, so this limit would be 17 lakh. Now 20 lakh minus 3 lakh, right? I think you have recalled this point also. Okay, meaning of certain terms, meaning of salary, if the employee is covered under gratuity, yeah, that is 15 by 26 into last on salary. What are the components of salary? Basic salary and DA. I have not written forming part of return benefits. No, entire DA, right? Last on salary means salary preceding to the month of retirement. Preceding to the month of retirement means his last salary. So I have given you the thumb rule. If this person has retired on the last day of the month, then you can take that month's salary. Let's say 31st October, then you can take October salary, basic and DA. If he's retiring somewhere in between, then you can go to preceding month. Correct? And for those who are employees who are not covered under Gratuity Act, so in that case, Salary means basic salary, DA forming part plus fixed percentage commission on turnover. You understand that this one is the RBS salary, which we, the same uh, components which we take in HRA exemption also. And average salary means average salary of the last 10 months immediately preceding the month of retirement. Here also, please follow the same concept. If that person is retiring on the last day of the month, 
include that month also in the last 10 months right so let's say if this person is retiring on 31st october please include october also october and go beyond uh, go till last 10 years so include october also so october september uh, august july june and so on go for 10, 10 months take these 10 months take uh, basic salary da forming part fixed percentage of commission on turnover and divided by 10 because you have to take the average salary right but yes if the person is retiring in between let's say in somewhere in middle of the october then ignore october start from september onwards from september go uh, go to uh, uh, august then uh, july june and so on right so this i have already discussed if he has already taken an exemption earlier then the fixed statutory limit that is of 20 lakh will be reduced will be reduced to the exemption which we have already claimed earlier right got it then we have taxability of pension see taxability of pension again i'll say the same thing if it is a regular pension if it is a regular pension what is regular pension we also call it as an uncommuted pension we also call it as an uncommuted pension regular pension is something which you get every month that is called regular pension or uncommuted pension if a person is receiving regular pension or uncommuted pension that pension is fully taxable that pension is fully taxable please tax the entire pension over there and it will be taxed under the head salary right so let's say for example if your uh, um, one of your neighbor is uh, a retired person he's of let's say 65 or 70 years of age he's a retired person and now he's getting pension and he, he will ask you whether my pension is taxable and under which head please tell him that uh, it would be taxable because it is a regular pension which he receives every month so it will be taxable under the head salary so whatever is the pension let's say his pension is 50000 per month so 50000 into 12 that is 6 lakh rupees is fully taxable it will be his gross salary and yes standard deduction will also be available from this pension because this is nothing but gross salary right from gross salary we will give deductions also so regular pension is fully taxable even if it is government employee it will be fully taxable so please remember uncommuted uncommuted on the other hand commuted means commuted means lump sum lump sum pension or we can also say commuted pension that is a lump sum pension but uncommuted pension is fully taxable what about lump sum pension because when a person gets retired his employer can also give him given an option that if you would like to take a lump sum pension you can take the lump sum pension then we will not give you regular that much so you can commute your pension you can uh, actually uh, get the pension cumulative that is entire pension you can either you can opt for the entire pension that i would like to get it lump sum or you can uh, to certain extent let's say 60 percent 70 percent 80 percent you can get the pension commuted and you can get the lump sum amount also so if you are getting a lump sum pension in that case if the employee is a central government employee state government employee or a local authority employee that is a government employee central government state government and including local authority employee also the lump sum pension is fully exempt the commuted pension would be fully exempt getting it if this person is a non-government employee he is not a central government employee not a state government employee neither a local authority employee other employee if that person is uh, getting a lump sum pension then it is exempt it is not fully exempt but it is exempt up to a certain limit how much would be the limit it depends upon whether this person is receiving gratuity also or not whether this person is receiving gratuity also or not if this this person is getting gratuity also and lump sum pension also then we will give in give him exemption but to a lower amount we will give him a low amount of exemption but because he is getting both the things because he is getting you can learn in this way that if he is getting pension also and gratuity also then we should give him because he is getting two facilities gratuity as well as commuted pension so we will give him exemption but to a lower amount but if he is not getting gratuity he is only getting lump sum pension not getting gratuity then we will give him exemption to a little higher amount of a little higher amount will give him an exemption so tell me which one is least of the following one upon two is least or one upon three is a lower value sir one upon three means 33.33 percent right one upon two means 50 percent so this one is a lower value right one upon three is a lower value 
and 1 upon 2 is a higher value. So if this person is also receiving gratuity with commuted pension, this person is also receiving gratuity, we will give that, that person an exemption but a lower amount of exemption. So we will give him exemption of one third. But if this person is not gra getting gratuity, so in this case he is getting only commuted pension, so we will give him a higher amount of exemption. How much? 1 upon 2, right? So you can all you will have to learn 1 upon 2 and 1 upon 3, and now you can easily identify when I have to apply 1 upon 2 or, or when I have to apply 1 upon 3. So 1 upon 3 is a lower number. So when you are giving him a low, uh, when you will give a lower exemption to that particular person, if he is receiving double benefits, if he is receiving pension also and gratuity also, you will give him 1 upon 3 exemption. But if this person is receiving only pension, not gratuity, please give him higher exemption 1 upon 2. Okay. 1 upon 3 of what? 1 upon 2 of what? 1 upon 2 or 1 upon 3 of the amount of commuted pension if he would have commuted his entire pension. What would have been the entire commuted pension? If he, he, if he would have commuted his entire pension, then this is the amount which you have to do 1 upon 3 or 1 upon 2. So how you will calculate it? So let's say his pension is, let's say he receive a commuted pension. He receive a commuted pension of rupees 7 lakh. And he got his pension commuted to the extent of 70%. He didn't get his 100% pension commuted. He just got his pension commuted up to the extent of 70%. Remaining 30% he keeps as uncommuted, right? So 7 lakh is the amount which is equivalent to 70%. So tell me how much is the amount which is equivalent to 100%. So you can easily say 7 lakh divided by 70%. 70 into 100 you can do or simply on calculator you can write for 7 lakh divide 70 percent. You will get what would have been the amount which if he would have commuted his entire pension, right? So of that amount you have to do 1 upon 3 and 1 upon 2. This is the exemption amount. So how you, you will write 1 upon 3 of whatever is the commuted pension was 7 lakh, whatever is the commuted pension upon the percentage of commutation, upon percentage of commutation. So by this value, by using this value, you will receive the amount if he would have uh, got his entire pension commuted, right? So of this amount, you will do 1 upon 3 exemption or if he is not getting any gratuity, then of this amount, you will do 1 by 2, right? So I'm again repeating, let's revise it once again. So for pension, if it is a regular pension or uncommuted pension, this would be fully taxable. This would be fully taxable for all employees. But if it is a lump sum pension or a commuted pension, it depends whether the employee is a government employee, central, state or local authority, fully exempt. If it is another employee, not fully exempt, but up to a certain limit. So it depends upon gratuity. If he is receiving gratuity also, we will give him a lower amount of exemption, 1 upon 3. If the person is not receiving gratuity, we will give him a higher amount of exemption, 1 upon 2. And 1 upon 2 or 1 upon 3 of what? Of whatever the community mentioned divided by percentage of commutation, right? If you are simply applying 70, let's say 70 percent he got is commuted, you can either say 70 percent, you can in your calculator you simply divide by 70, then press the percentage button or you can do uh, into 100 also. That is one the same thing, right? And please also remember that the pension which is received by the winners of Paramvir Chakra or Gallantry Award winners, for them it is exempt. So Paramvir Chakra, Mahavir Chakra or such Gallantry Award, uh, if the person is receiving pension, in that case that pension would be exempt. Okay. Now the third retirement benefit is the leave salary. We did gratuity, we have done pension also. Now the third is one is leave salary. So how you will compute the Taxability of leave salary. What is leave salary? Actually, your employer provides you with leaves, with some leaves they provide you. And they also offer that if you don't avail these leaves, if you don't avail these leaves, if you um, keep on accumulating your leaves, you keep on saving your leaves, 
then we will give you the amount we will uh, we will convert these leaves into a monetary value and we will give you the amount also that is called leave encashment so leave salary or leave encashment whether it is taxable or it is exempt we will see over here first of all understand let's say if you are getting the encashment every year if the if your employer allows you that you can encash your leaves every year don't wait till retirement or resignation you can every year whatever leaves you save we will give you the amount equivalent amount of that if it is a regular leave salary which you receives every year then in that case it is fully taxable the same way gratuity if you are receiving during the continuity of service that is fully taxable pension if you are receiving regularly that is fully taxable leave salary if you are receiving regularly your uh, employer allows you that you can encash your leaves every year and he simply gives you the amount every year so that amount is fully taxable so leave salary received during the continuity of job is fully taxable but 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 if you are getting leave salary you are not in cashing every year but you are saving your leaves up to the time of retirement or resignation or termination we can say it anything uh, we can understand it in this way that you are now leaving this organization so when the person when the employee is leaving this organization and at the, that time if that person is offered the leave salary is given the leave salary in that case it could be exempt it could be exempt in that case so again if it is a government employee but please remember local authority employees are not included over here in government employees definition here it it only includes central government or state government employee local authority will be counted in other employees over here in gratuity and in pension we have considered local authority employees also as government employees but here in leave salary we are only considering central government and state government employees as a government employee okay there is a change over here so if the leave salary is if it is a central or state government employee they are getting leave salary at the time of retirement resignation termination etc then it would be fully exempt but yes if these people are getting leave salary during the continuity of job fully taxable for them also right it is only we are seeing at the time of retirement or resignation that is that person is leaving the organization in that case it would be fully exempt only for central government and state government employees but if the employee is not central government or state government he is other employee non government employee including local authority employee then it is exempt least of the following here there are four points first and here it becomes important also because this is uh, a amendment also there is a little uh, small amendment also so this um, taxability of perquisite of this uh, sorry not perquisite of leave salary is uh, important for our 2024 examination also okay so what are the four points least of the following you have to exempt first is actual leave salary whatever the leave salary which you are getting whatever the employer is giving you at the time of retirement or resignation or termination that leave salary actual leave salary first second is the statutory limit earlier it used to be 3 lakh but now it is 25 lakh now it is 25 lakh right so there is an amendment over here actual leave salary 25 lakh 10 into average salary 10 into average salary what would be the components of salary over here same component rbs what is rbs retirement benefit salary what all three components are there basic salary da forming part of retirement benefits and fixed percentage commission on turnover right so that is salary we have to take average of last 10 months preceding the date of retirement preceding the date of retirement we have to take the uh, 10 months average salary and every salary you have to take those three components of rbs so whatever is the average salary take the average salary of uh, take entire 10 months divided by 10 so that you can get the average salary and once you get the average salary multiply it by 10 right third one is important leaves which you have saved that is called leaves in credit right this is nothing but the leaves which you have saved during the entire tenure that is called leaves in credit into average salary. but please remember whatever the leaves which you have saved if you have calculated in days please first convert them into months so whatever the days which you have saved as leave then you have to convert that days into month why you are converting into month because you are multiplying this number with the average salary average salary here means per month salary 
right? Whatever was the average of the last 10 months, you have done the average. So you have received a month salary, a month salary. So if this is per month salary, so um, you have to multiply it by months only. You cannot multiply it by days, right? It would be a very huge figure then, right? So whatever the leaves, please remember this, whatever the leaves which you have saved is, should be, uh, finally should be converted into months so that you can ultimately multiply it by the average salary. So what is leaves in credit? This is nothing but leave saved. How you will calculate the leave saved? I tell you, let's say you are working with a company. You are working with a company. Let's say you are working with Amazon India. Let's say you are working with Amazon India and Amazon India is the employer and uh, Mr. A is an employee. So Amazon India gives you leaves, they grant you leave, they, uh, they allow you that you can take 25 days of leaves every year. 25 days of leaves you can take every year. This is called leaves allowed. So Amazon allows 25 days leaves, let's say. This is, this could be, um, we can, I can also say this is leaves allowed. I can also say these are leaves granted. I can call it by any name, right? So 25 days is the leaves which are allowed. Amazon says you can take leaves. Let's say Mr. A, every year, he takes leaves, five, okay, six days leaves. Let's say, let me take it six. He takes six days leaves every year. Every year he takes six days leave. What is this is called leaves availed. This is called leaves availed. This is leaves availed. Okay. So tell me every year, let's let me assume it that every year he takes only six days leave. So out of 25 days, he takes six days leaves. So how much leaves he saves? Actually, he saves 19 days leaves. So leaves saved, or I can say is leaves in credit is 19 days leaves every year, right? This is the number of leaves which is saved, which is just leaves in the credit, right? But yes, there is one more point. Let's say he also, Amazon also says that if you would like to encash your whatever leaves you have, you have saved, if you would like to encash also, you can encash every year. But yes, if you are, you would be encashing every year, it will be taxable, fully taxable. So Mr. What does Mr. A do? He takes six days leaves and at the same time, he also get four days leaves in cash every year. That will become fully taxable in that very year in which he is in cashing those leaves. So let's say he also in cash four days leaves, four days leaves every year, he keeps on in cashing. So tell me how much is the uh, leaves number of days which he saves every year. Sir, his company gives him 25 days leaves. Every year he used to avail, he used to take six days leave. He used to go on holiday or for six days. He used to avail six days leaves and four days leaves he used to get the money off, right? He used to in cash also. So what will Amazon say? Out of 25, you have already taken six days vacations. You have in cash four days. So you are now left with 15 days leave. So leaves in credit would be in that case would be 15 days, not 19 because he is now in cashing also. So it would be 15 days, right? So how can I calculate leaves in credit? I can sim simply calculate leaves in credit is equal to whatever the leaves are granted by your employer, granted by employer minus leaves which are availed by the employee you can build your own formula, right? And this is very easy to build. Whatever the leaves granted 25, whatever the leaves which you have availed. And also if it is given in the question that in every year he used to in cash also, then whatever the leaves which is getting in cash also, that should be also deducted. So every year this person is saving 15 days. Let's say he has worked with this company. In one year, he has saved 15 days. In two years, how much he will save? So first year, 15. Second year, 15. 30 days. In three years, how much he will save? 15. Let's say every year he has the same pattern, right? 
so in three years he he will say 15 first 15 second 15 then 45 days or i can say 15 into three right if he has worked for four years sir 15 into four 60 days leaves he will save if he has worked for five years sir 15 into five 75 days leaves he has saved let's say he has worked for uh 20 years and 11 months sir for 20 years we can easily calculate 15 days every year, 15 days into 20 and for 11 months we should take, no, you don't have to take part of the year, you have to ignore part of the year, right, see income tax is very simple, they are not even uh, giving you that you have to do a proportionate amount or so, no, so, see income tax is such a simple law, so they are saying don't worry about it, just ignore the part of the year, ignore entire part of the year, whether it is more than 6 months, less than 6 months, ignore it completely, only take this completed years, okay. So every year he is saving 15 days leaves. So 15 days he has saved 15 days into and this is 15, 15, 15, how many? 20. So 20 years he has saved. So this comes to 300 days. What is this 300 days? 300 days is leaves in credit. This is called leaves in credit. Got it? Easy. So this is leaves in credit. Okay, the, now leaves in credit, we have to multiply with average salary. Let's say his average salary is 50,000. So should I multiply it by 300 days into 50,000? No, sir. You have said that finally, whatever the days which you have received, which you have got after calculating this, you have to convert them into months. So please convert them into months because you are multiplying with average salary. And this is average salary of last 10 months. And you, once you have done the average, so that means a month's salary. So if this salary is in per month, then you have to multiply with a number which is in months, not in days. So that is the reason I am saying that please, please convert them in this into month. How do you convert them? Simply take that on an average there is uh, for every in every month there is 30 days. So keep 30 as number of days in a month. So divide by 30. So you will get 10 months, right? So please convert them 300 days. We can say this is equal to 10 months. Simply we have divided it by 30. So 10 months is the lease of the credit into average salary. This is the our fourth point, right? Last point which I have to mention is that here how much lease is granted? 25 days. Okay. So you will calculate leaves granted 25 days minus leaves availed 6 days minus in cash 4 days. 15 days leaves every year multiplied by only completed years. So we'll, you will get the leaves in credit in days, convert them into month. Okay. If this would have been 30 days, if the company gives you leaves, uh, grant you leaves for 30 days, you will say leaves granted 30 days minus leaves availed minus leaves in cash. If this would have been 35 days, you will say granted 35 minus leaves minus in cash. No. If it is up to 30 days, then it is fine. If it is up to, if the leaves granted by the employer is up to 30 days, it is fine. But if in case it is more than 30 days, then while calculating leaves in credit, please don't take more than 30. If let's say if this company Amazon India gives you 40 days leaves, okay, they, they grant you 40 days leaves, please while calculating this leaves in credit, please only take maximum 30. You don't have to take more than that, right? This is something which you have to remember. Okay, let's come back. So again, let me uh, repeat this. So leave salary, if you are in, in cashing your leave every year regular on regular basis, that is during the continuity of job, it would be fully taxable. But if you get this leave salary at the time of retirement, resignation, termination, etc., that is at the time when you are leaving this organization. If you are a central government employee or a state government employee, fully exempt. Local authority employee, it will be included in other employee. So for other employees, including local authority, least of the four would be exempt. First is actual leave salary, which you have received. 25 lakhs is the statutory limit. Yes, again, the same uh, provision will apply here as well because this 25 lakh room limit earlier it used to be 3 lakh, but now with amendment it is 25 lakh. Okay. So I was saying the same provision which we have done in gratuity also, the same will apply here as well. 25 lakh is the lifetime limit. So if this person has worked with some previous employer earlier where he has received the leave salary at the time of retirement from that employer. He has claimed certain exemption. Let's say he has taken an exemption of 3 lakh rupees. So now this limit will be reduced by the exemption claimed earlier. So if he has claimed an exemption, let's say of 3 lakh rupees. So this limit will be 25 minus 3. It would be 22. Got it? Easy, busy. 
Okay. Third is 10 into average salary. And last is leaves at the credit. And please calculate this leaves first in days, then convert it into months and into average salary. Average salary means last 10 months salary preceding the date of retirement. Salary component same as RBS, retirement benefit salary, which you take in. Why I have given it a name RBS? Because it is used uh, at many places. First, we have used it at HRA. Second, we have seen that the, uh, in gratuity, the people who are not covered into the Payment of Gratuity Act, that is covered over there. Third time, it is now covered here also in leave salary. I'll tell you in um, provident fund calculation also it is covered. So it is covered at many places. Actually, the reference of this component of salary basic DA forming part fixed percentage commission on turnover is at many places. That is the reason to recall it um, easily, to remember it easily. I have given it a name, RBS, Retirement Benefit Salary. Okay. Leaves in credit, you understand how you will calculate. But please, if it is 30 days or less, then you can easily take those days. But in case leaves granted is more than 30 days, while calculating, calculating this amount, take maximum 30 days. Only completed years has to be taken. 9 years, 11 months. Please ignore 11 months. Only 9 years has to be taken. And if the employee has already availed an exemption in any earlier previous year, then this 25 lakh statutory limit will be reduced by the exemption claimed in any earlier year. Okay. So let me start with the provident fund. You have to give me a minute. So provident fund is another important retirement benefit. And we see also examiner often ask about provident fund treatment. First of all, understand there is different kinds of provident fund when it's called statutory provident fund recognized and unrecognized these three funds are employees provident fund only employer can open these funds for the employee there is another provident fund which is also known as ppf public provident fund but this is not related to salary this provident fund this is rather a type of investment which any person can open this provident fund. They, they can step into bank, they can step into SBI or PNB, and they can get a public provident fund open for themselves. And this is not necessary. An employee can open it. Any person, even who is having his own business or profession, that person can also open a provident fund. Anyone, I can open this, you can op open this provident fund. There's a minimum requirement that minimum every year you have to deposit at least 500 rupees. And you can open this provident fund. This is an investment. Uh, in this case, we have a deduction in ATC. We can, as it is allowed that it is an eligible investment. If you are depositing here, if the any person who is depositing it here can claim a deduction under section ATC if that person is following the optional scheme. Because you understand, chapter six says generally these deductions are available only under optional scheme. Only there are three deductions which are available in new tax regime. That I'll tell you in the deduction chapter. So here I'll not be discussing much about PPF because this is not related to salary. This is employer will not deposit this any amount to PPF. This is only the SSE who will deposit this amount, right? So I'll talk about these three provident fund because these are the part of salary. First of all, understand what is statutory, what is the difference between these funds, what is statutory, what is recognized and what is unrecognized. Statutory provident fund is generally governed by provident fund act 1925 you don't have to remember this but you should know and generally the government employees government employees are covered under this such type of fund for government employees government opens of uh, deposit their amount in statutory provident fund and non-government employees in fact non-government employers deposit their employees pf in recognized provident fund what does recognize means because it is also governed under an act there is a pf act 1952 and so you don't have to remember this but yes it is also governed as per law and it is recognized by the commissioner and chief commissioner of income tax so this is also a recognized provident fund so both these funds are governed as per law they are governed as per law and if employer has deposited any amount for the employee then it is employees fund now it is employees money employer cannot take the amount out from it once it is deposited it is now of employee he can withdraw this amount whenever he will be retiring from this particular organization or he will be resigning from that he or she will be resigning 
from the particular organization, then they can withdraw this amount also, right? Employer has no role. He can only deposit, but he cannot withdraw, right? Where is unrecognized provident fund? The name itself indicates that there is no, it is not governed under any law, unrecognized. So if employer opens such account, such provident fund account for the employees, so no, no uh, government authority or no, not any other recognized authority has control over it. Even the entire control is of employer. Employer is depositing, but if employer wants to withdraw also, he can withdraw the amount anytime. Even some employer can run away with this amount. So if your amount is getting deposited in an unrecognized provident fund, it is not sure that whether you will be receiving this amount or not because this amount is 100% under the control of the employer. So if that amount is being deposited every year for the employee, should am I 100% sure that this amount will be received by the employee? The answer is no. So employee does not pay any tax until and unless he receives the amount from this unrecognized provident fund because you never know whether you will get this amount or not so whenever you will receive this amount whenever you will receive this amount only in that case in that year taxability can arise not every year but in spf or rpf we see whenever the amount has been deposited in the account although i understand that employee has not actually received it. It is an employee's provident fund account. The amount has been deposited. But this is 100% sure that this amount belongs to the employee. He will get it. That is the reason in chapter number one, we have discussed there are certain incomes which are deemed to be received, which are deemed to be received. Actually, we have not actually received it, but it is deemed to be received. Why? Because it is your income. Don't worry, you will get it one day or the other, whenever you will be retiring from this particular organization or um, leaving this organization, then you can withdraw this amount. So this amount is, although every year it is being deposited, it is not actually received by the employee, but ultimately he will receive it. So we say that every year the amount which is deposited is deemed to be received. That is the reason we uh, tax that amount every year. To a certain extent it is exempt, but to some extent it is taxable also. We will see how much is taxable in this case, right? In statutory provident fund, generally we see most of the time it is exempt. Everything is exempt. To certain limit, it is exempt in RPF. To certain limit, above that limit, it is taxable. But let's understand first unrecognized provident fund, right? PPF, we know that it is not part of salary. Any, It is just an investment and it's an eligible investment where we can claim ATC deduction. An employer does not uh, deposit any amount over here. So if employer is is not depositing any amount over here, there is no question of salary, right? So let's discuss with URPF. So as I have already mentioned that there is no control of any law or any authority over here, this entire unrecognized, we also call it a URPF. It is controlled by employer. So he has the ultimate authority. If employee receives this amount, then he can say that this is my income. Otherwise, he will not say that this is your income. So whatever amount is deposited every year, it will not become the, the income. Once it is matured and is and it is given to the employee, then employee will receive it. You understand how PF uh, thing works? Because employee, some amount is also deducted from the employee's salary and it is deposited in fund. Employer also contributes over and above your salary. Employer also contributes some amount that is called employer contribution. So every year or in fact, every month, some contribution is from the employee's side or some contribution is from the employer side that we call employee contribution or employer contribution. This amount is getting deposited and that is for a very long period and you earn interest also on this particular amount. So whenever you will be receiving this amount on the on, at the time of maturity, when you are PF, you will be receiving it. Let's say you receive 20 lakh, 25 lakh, 30 lakh rupees. So actually, if you will technically see this amount, it has four parts. It has four parts because every month, every year, employee has also contributed to this amount. Employer has also contributed to this fund. And we have earned the interest also on this fund on employee's contribution also and on employer's contribution also. So if you will see, I'll tell you. See, employee also contributes to this fund. This is the fund. Employees also contribute. 
and employer also contributes to this fund employer also contributes right and we earn interest also on employees contribution we earn interest on employees contribution and on employers contribution also contribution also we earn interest right so let's say at the time of maturity you receive in from urpf i'm talking about urpf first you receive total of let's say 40 lakh rupees so a uh, question will tell you that this 40 lakh comprises of what all amount so it has four parts so let's say uh, this uh, 15 lakh is employees contribution let's say 15 lakh is employer contribution 5 lakh is the interest on employee contribution and 5 lakh is the employer contribution that makes total of 40 15 plus 15 plus 5 plus 5 so you have received 40 lakh rupees so if, is 40 lakh is my income the answer is yes but this part employee contribution is not an income because why because this is nothing but an investment we have invested it and now we are give, getting this amount back so whatever the extra amount which you get on your investment that is income right because it is same like let's say if you are getting salary let's say if you have received 1 lakh rupees salary and you deposit that 1 lakh rupees into a bank and next day if you withdraw that 1 lakh rupees out from the bank that you say that i don't want to deposit it i would like to take it back so once first day you have deposited it next day you are taking it back is it your income the answer is no that is i am taking back my investment but what if if you have deposited rupees 1 lakh into that account and you re receive back 1 lakh 10000 rupees so that extra amount which you receive 10000 that extra amount that is your income so whatever the employee contribution, this is every year, every month, employee was contributing. Now he is receiving this money back. So this is not an income. 15 lakh would not an income. So out of 40, please don't text this 15 lakh. I'm talking about URPF right now. This is happening at the time of maturity. Whatever the amount which he has received extra on his investment, that is his income. So on 15 lakh, on employee's contribution, there was an interest of 5 lakh. So this 5 lakh, is an income of IFOS. So this would be treated as your IFOS income. And this amount, 15 lakh, which employer has contributed because uh, prior to this, before maturity, before this withdrawal, we were not sure whether this amount we will actually receive it or not because we have no control over it. Only the employer has control. But now if we have actually received this amount, this is, this is our account amount now. We can say, yes, this is the income which we have earned. And who has given this income? Employer. So this is salary. And even this amount of 5 lakh rupees, which is the interest earned on employer's money. So this is the interest which is earned on your money or employer's money, on employer's money. So 15 lakh he has deposited. On that 15 lakh, 5 lakh rupees was earned. So these 15 and 5 will be taxed under the head salary at the time of maturity. So in URPF, you understand. URPF is not taxed every year. It is not taxed every year, only at the time of maturity. Whatever the amount which you receive, you have to see which amount I am receiving. Just make it five, four parts of it. So of employee contribution, please don't tax this amount. Only interest on employer contribution is taxable as IFOS and employer contribution and interest thereon on employer contribution, it is taxable as salary. So out of 40, 15 lakh will not be taxed. Only 25 lakh rupees will be taxed. 25 is 15 plus 5 plus 5. But out of this, only this amount, 15 plus 5, 20 lakh would be salary income. 5 lakh would be your IFOS income. Okay. Examiner can ask you about this also. This has been asked in uh, past as well. And they can ask you in your 2024 examinations also. So this, you know, all PF works in this almost the same manner. It has employees contribution and interest on employees contribution. It has employers contribution also and interest on employer contribution also. So we uh, were discussing as of now URPF, how we will treat URPF. So every year don't tax anything, wait till maturity. And whether this investment is eligible under ATC? No. Under ATC, only statutory PF investment is allowed or RPF is allowed and PPF is also allowed. But this is not an eligible investment under ATC also. Okay. So let me discuss URPF first. 
So employee contribution, it is an investment and not an income. We understand. And ATC is also not allowed. It is not an eligible investment. When we will do ATC in our deduction chapter, I'll tell you that URPF is not an eligible investment. SPF is eligible, RPF is eligible, but URPF is not eligible. PPF is also eligible, but that is not related to salary. Anybody can invest that amount and that is an eligible investment for ATC. Okay. Employer contribution will become salary income only at the time of maturity, not every year. So this one is give, uh, given over here that give me a moment okay taxable as salary in the year of actual receipt not every year and interest on employer contribution interest on employer contribution for urpf again salary income because this is the amount which is earned on employer's money so this is again a salary income but only at the time when it is received at the time of maturity not every year so salary income when amount is actually received Interest on employees contribution is IFOS when the amount will actually be received. So it is fully taxable as IFOS, however, in the year of actual receipt, right? And taxability as maturity, yes, it will be taxable. Whatever the amount which you have received would be taxable, but employee contribution will not be taxable because this is the investment which we have received back. Only the interest on employee contribution is taxable as IFOS. Employer contribution and interest thereon will be taxable as salary, right? It's taxable as follows. Salary income, employee contribution and interest there on IFOS, interest on employee contribution. Got it? This is how you will treat URPF. Okay. Let us discuss SPF and RPF also. So whatever employee contributes, employee contributes from their salary. Employee contributes from their salary. So this is not an income. This is rather an investment. And in ATC, we will see that these are eligible for ATC reduction also if the employee or the assessee is following optional scheme. So employee contribution, it is an investment and not an income. Same RPF, it is an investment, not an income. ATC is allowed, ATC is allowed, but yes, not under default regime. It is only under the optional scheme if the assessee is following. Right? Employer contribution. Whatever employer contributes to provident fund, SPF or RPF, SPF is fully exempt. SPF is generally for government employees and it is mainly fully exempt. But if the employer contributes to RPF, this is important. If employer contributes to RPF, it is although exempt, but if it is in excess of 12% of salary and here salary again means the same three components, basic salary, DA forming part of retirement benefits, fixed percentage commission on turnover, right? So. 12% of retirement benefit salary. If the employer contributes to RPF, RPF recognized provident fund, then it is exempt. But if it is in excess of 12% of salary, that is RBS salary, then such excess would be taxable. Such excess would be taxable. And also there is one more limit of 7.5 lakh, which I'll be discussing in just two, three minutes. And there is one more limit of 7 lakh 50,000 rupees. If it is Let's say if it is not more than 12% of RBS, but it is more than 7.5 lakh also. If it is in excess of 7.5 lakh, then also it would be taxable. I'll be discussing it in a couple of minutes. Next, interest on employer contribution. So whatever the employer is contributing, will that also be taxed? Yes, it could be taxed as salary. But if it is SPF, then it is fully exempt. If it is RPF, then although it is exempt, but if the interest rate is up to 9.5%, okay, exempted. But if it is the interest rate is more than 9.5%, so whatever is the excess interest rate, that amount will be taxed every year. Every year, it is the income which is not actually received, but deemed to be received, right? Because this income will ultimately go to employee and there is no um, uh, doubt about it. It is 100% sure this is a guarantee that this amount belongs to employee. Employer cannot withdraw this amount, right? Employer cannot take this amount. So if the interest rate, let's say it is 10%, so up to 9.5% is allowed, that excess 0.5%, 0.5% will become taxable, right? Do you remember that? Are you able to recall these provisions? Interest on employees contribution. So interest on employee contribution is generally IFOS, but if it is statutory, it is exempt. It is, if it is RPF again exempt, but up to 9.5%, if it is in excess of 9.5%, then it will be taxable. Also, in the year 2021, there is an amendment of the interest on employees contribution. 
if employee is contributing please remember this if employee is contributing more than 250000 rupees if the employee has contributed during the year more than 250000 rupees so whatever is the excess contribution interest earned on such excess contribution will be taxable every year as ifos both in spf also in rpf also should i repeat it once again if the employee contributes so let me explain you if the employee contributes to spf or even to rpf both will be the same if the employer contribution to spf or rpf during the previous year is more than 2.5 lakh let's say it is 10 lakh uh, 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 sorry it is 3 lakh 10 thousand let's say let's say employee contributes to this fund every year this year he contributes 3 lakh 10 thousand so whatever is the excess of 2.5 lakh so how much is the excess of 2.5 lakh 60 thousand rupees so the interest 60 thousand is not taxable the interest on such 60,000, the interest earned, interest on such excess, that is, here it is, rupees 60,000. So that interest will be taxable as IFOS. That interest will be taxable as IFOS. This was the amendment from 1st of April 2021. So initially prior to that, it was not taxable, but after 1 for 2021, it is taxable. So if the employee contributes more than 2.5 lakh, it would be taxable. The interest on such excess would be taxable, right? So first calculate the excess and whatever the interest earned on such excess would be taxable as IFOS, right? And there is one more provision over here. Let's say if the employee contributes 2.5 in excess of 2.5 lakh, something employer was also contributing. But if in case, if there is any case where employer does not contribute to PF, if there is any case where employer does not contribute to PF, then we have to take the excess, which is an excess of 5 lakh. Then we will replace this 2.5 lakh by 5 lakh. So whatever is the excess amount over and above 5 lakh, that excess amount, on that excess amount, we have to calculate interest. That interest will be taxable. So if employee and employer both are contributing to PF, then we will take 2.5 lakh. But if only employee is contributing to PF, no, employer is not contributing to PF, in that case, this limit, we will see not of not 2.5 lakh, but rather 5 lakh rupees, right? So can there be any situation where only employee contributes, employer does not contribute to provident fund? Generally, there is no such uh, scenario, but yes, uh, uh, now there is uh, also an option for the employer to contribute in pension scheme. So now practically some employer opts that they, co they don't contribute to provident fund, only employee contributes to provident fund, they contribute to pension scheme. So if it is happening in that way, then there might be a situation when employer does not contribute to PF. Otherwise, this was very practical. You don't have to remember this, right? This was just for your knowledge. Okay. So however, if the employee contributes more than 2.5 lakh in a year, then interest on such excess contribution shall become IFOS income. Note the limit of 2.5 lakh will become 5 lakh if there is no employer contribution. This provision was inserted, this entire provision was inserted from 1 for 2021. No need to remember this date. Okay. Taxability on maturity, you understand how URPF is taxable on maturity, but these SPF and RPF are generally not taxable on maturity because uh, SPF is generally exempt. However, if it is more than employee contribution is more than 2.5 lakh or 5 lakh as the case may be interest on that is was taxable every year and RPF also if employer contribution in excess of 12% of salary we are taxing it every year. So on maturity will be which uh, on maturity whatever the amount which employee must be receiving from these funds should be taxable it again no we will not taxable we will not make it taxable at maturity. So taxability and maturity SPF is not taxable. RPF is also generally not taxable. I have used the term generally not taxable. Why? Because if employee withdraws the amount from such RPF, 
before five years. Before five years, then this RPF will become taxable. This RPF maturity will become taxable if he withdraws this amount before five years. There are also certain exceptions of this five years. Let's say if the employee is withdrawing this amount for, from, uh, before five years. Why? Because there were certain circumstances which have happened, which are beyond the control of the employee. He has to leave that job. And this was, uh, it was not intentional, but he has to. There were certain cir circumstances which had happened, which has taken place that he has to leave this, that job. It was not his voluntary retirement, but or resignation, but he has to. There were certain circ circumstances which had occurred. Like he had met with an accident or he is now um, ill to that extent that he cannot go and work. Or if the company has shut down their business or they have shut down or curtailed any of their operations or unit in that case or anything which had happened which is beyond the control of the employee if that person proves that he is uh, uh, not left the job intentionally but he has to leave the job it was not his mistake then in that case that amount which he withdraws before five years also that could be exempt so here it is mentioned taxability on maturity SPF is fully exempt, RPF is generally exempt. However, if withdrawal is before five years of service, then it would be taxable. And I have also written it over here. This, this has also some ex certain exceptions. If the amount is getting withdrawn before five years, but it was due to ill health of, or accident of the employee or employer's business is shut down or any of the unit is got shut or any other cause beyond the control of the employee. In that case also, that amount which is received at the time of withdrawing before five years that could also be accepted right now let me discuss a very important point with you give me a minute okay there are two perquisites which are related to rpf there are two perquisites which are related to rpf section 17 to 7 and section 17 to 7a let's discuss them as well okay First of all, we have already discussed 17 to 7. What it was uh, when I was discussing perquisite with you. So there was a provision of approved superannuation fund. You remember? There was a perquisite employer contribution to approved. Superannuation. What is superannuation? Superannuation is retirement age. So if employer contributes in any fund, which is approved superannuation fund, so this amount, whatever the amount employer contributes is generally exempt. But if it is more than 7.5 lakh rupees, if it is more than 7.5 lakh rupees, such excess will become taxable. Let's say employer is contributing to the superannuation fund rupees 8 lakh. Then in excess of 7.5 lakh, that is 50,000 rupees will be taxable. And this perquisite is covered under, although you don't have to remember this number, but let me tell you for your knowledge, it is covered under section 17 to 7. Excess contribution in excess of 7.5 lakh. If this fund also shares uh, some other two funds also, recognize provident fund, or new pension scheme also. All three taken together. If employer contributes in this fund also, this fund also, this fund also, or any of these funds, if it is more than 7.5 lakh rupees, it would be taxable. That is why we have were just discussing also here is as well. I was saying, you know, I'll be discussing this. See. This is RPF, recognized provident fund. Employer contribution. If employer is contributing more than 12% of salary and even there is one more limit of 7.5 lakh. Why I have written it 7.5 lakh over here? Because of that 17 uh, to 7 per Q set, this per Q set. Because now if employer contributes to either S SAF or to recognized provident fund or to new pension scheme or all three taken together or any of the two, you can make any of the combination of permutations. But if employer is contributing more than 7.5 lakh, please make it taxable. Please make it taxable. Right. So this is 17 to 7. And there is 
वन मोर प्रोविजन विच वॉज इंसर्टेड इन द ईयर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी दे से दे हैव इंसर्टेड वन मोर परक्यूज इट सेवनटीन टू सेवन ए अगेन आई एम सेंग नो नीड टू रिमेंबर दिस नंबर बट स्टिल यू शुड नो द प्रोविजन सेवनटीन टू सेवन ए सेज दैट इन केस इफ employer contributes if employer contributes to these funds if employer contributes to these funds in excess of 7.5 lakh that will be taxable that will be taxable for sure and whatever is the income earned on such excess i'm again saying i'm again repeating whatever is the income earned on such excess that will also be taxable under section 17 to 7 so let's say there is an employee who is working with some company let's say he is working with tata motors tata motors contributes rupees 9 lakh 10000 rupees let's say to saf superannuation fund or to rpf or to new pension scheme any of these funds or all three group together Let's say employer contributes. Tata Motors contributes nine lakh ten thousand rupees. So what will seventeen to seven say? Sir, you are contributing more than seven point five lakh. Then such excess will be taxable. So how much it is? One lakh sixty thousand. One lakh sixty thousand will be taxable under seventeen to seven. Got it. And also. the interest on such excess the income earned on such excess that income can be in the form of interest it can be form of in any dividend or any type of income whatever the income i can also give it a name i am giving it a name accretion accretion is nothing but the income the extra amount which you are i can say it income also i am i can say it accretion also accretion is nothing but the income that income can be in the form of in interest dividend etc anything generally it is interest so whatever the interest or income or accretion which you earn on such excess will also be taxable so let's say the interest rate is 10% so whatever the interest you will earn on this amount that will also be taxable under the perquisite 17 to 7 now can you uh, dif differentiate between 17 to 7 and 17 to 7a 17 to 7 is the excess amount that will become your income okay 17 to 7a is the income earned on such excess amount getting it the income earned on such excess amount that will be tax will also under 17 to 7 now how to calculate such income now the question arises how to calculate some such income very easy first of all law has given us a formula law has given us a formula it is uh, from law in your institute study material it is there and same formula i have copied from the study material itself actually this is as per law the same term terminology which uh, law has used the same technology uh, terminology institute has used same technology uh, terminology i am using it okay we are talking about 17 to 7 a annual accretion so any interest dividend or any income earned on such excess amount will be taxable and how cbdt has given us the formula this formula cbdt has given central board of direct taxes how much is the tp tp means taxable perquisite how much would be the annual accretion that would be taxable on such excess they have given us the formula pc upon 2 into r plus pc1 plus tp1 into r sir how you learn this formula okay let's understand what is this formula how this formula has derived let's understand this first of all let me give you an example let's say there is a company tata consultancy services we also call it as tcs and there is one of uh, the higher uh, one of the executive employees at a, somewhere at board level or higher position level like ceo cfo etc there is a employee mr a who is getting a very high salary um uh, and let's say he is getting a salary of um, 90 lakh 8 uh, 1 crore and so and employer contributes an employer contributes to rpf employer contributes to rpf tata consultancy contributes to rpf every month they contributes let's say 1 lakh rupees 
So this is employer contribution. Take a very I'm taking a very practical example. Employer is contributing. Let's say this is previous year 23, 24. So employer is contributing 1 lakh rupees every month to his provident fund. So the first month is April 23. So when Mr. A has received salary, from Mr. A's salary also contribution was deposited in provident fund and employer is also contributing to RPF. Let's say this is employer contribution which I am talking about. So employer has contributed 1 lakh rupees. Okay. Next month also same thing happened. In May 23, they have contributed 1 lakh rupees more. So first month, 1 lakh rupees is contributed to the fund. Interest will be earned on that, that 1 lakh rupees. Second month, 1 lakh rupees more is contributed. Now, how much is the total amount there? 2 lakh rupees. Interest will be earned on that 2 lakh. In June 23, same thing happened. 1 lakh more is contributed. How much is the amount now? 3 lakh. Interest will be computed on 3 lakh. I'm just trying um, to make you understand that how that formula is derived. So you don't have to learn that formula. You can simply apply your logics why this formula is there so that you can easily um, do your questions in your examinations as well. So same way, every month till March 2024, they keep on depositing 1 lakh rupees in his account so this amount is contributed so tell me in this year how much amount is contributed so every month 1 lakh is getting contributed over their employer contribution so total amount contributed is employer contribution is contribution in this year in previous year 23 24 is 12 lakh right this is employer just employer contribution and we understand that this is in excess of 7.5 lakh. So it is in excess of 7.5 lakh. So whatever is the excess, how much is the excess? 4 lakh 50,000. 4 lakh 50,000 is the excess contribution. So this will be taxable under 17 to 7. First of all, this amount will be taxable under 17 to 7 because this is the excess contribution. Okay, right. And we know that the interest earned or the income earned or I can also say the accretion that is nothing but the interest or income. The income earned on such excess will also be taxable. Let's say the interest rate is 9%. Let me tell you, uh, I'm giving you uh, a random interest rate. Let's say the interest rate is 9%. So what will our perquisite 17 to 7a will tell us? 17a, 17 to 7a, right? It will tell us that whatever the income which is earned on such excess, that will be taxable. Okay. So the taxable perquisite will be, I will say the taxable perquisite will be on 4,50,000. We will say let the rate of interest is 9%. We will say 9% would be the interest on such excess. 4,50,000 into 9%. Here I have made a mistake. What mistake I have I committed over here is, I have charged 9% on this entire 4,50,000, whatever the amount will come, somewhere about 45, 40, 36,000 something, 4,50,000 into 9%, let's say 40,500 is the amount which is coming. So 40,500 is this, 40,500 is the income under section 17 to 7 and the answer is no. Why? Because what mistake I have committed over here is I have calculated as if this 4,50,000 has been, this is the excess amount which has been deposited at the beginning of the year. That is the reason I have calculated 9% per annum, the entire 12 months interest. But you know, this amount, how this 4,50,000 has come? Sir, total amount 1 lakh, 1 lakh, 1 lakh, 1 lakh, every month it is being deposited. Total it was 12 lakh rupees. But we understand in excess of 7.5 lakh is taxable. So this 4,50,000 is accumulated, is being accumulated every month. And at the end, it becomes 450. In the beginning of the year, if you ask me, it was zero. But at the end, it becomes slowly, 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 it becomes every month it is being accumulated. So it becomes 450. So this 450 was not your opening amount. It is rather your closing am amount. But every month it is being contributed so that it can add up to 450. So we cannot say that we will calculate on this excess. We will simply calculate it, calculate the in entire interest rate. Let's say it is 9%. 
So we cannot do that. We have to calculate this interest on average amount because this amount opening was zero, closing is 450. So we have to take the average amount. So how much would be the average amount, sir? 450 by 2, that is 2,25,000. So we should calculate 9% on 2,25,000. This is a better method, right? So what we will do is we will say not on 450, but we will say 4,50,000 divided by 2, right? You understand why this divided by 2 is uh, there? Because we have to take the average amount. Because this year, whatever the amount was deposited was not the opening balance. It was being accumulated slowly, slowly, slowly every month and month and so on. So we say TP is equal to whatever the excess amount has been deposited. We are calling it PC, whatever the excess amount has been deposited divided by 2 into 9%, right? This is first part of this formula. This is first part of this formula. You can also refer here. TP is equal to PC upon 2 into R. Into R is nothing but the rate of return. That let's say the interest rate is 9%, 10%, whatever it is, you will apply that. So PC upon 2 plus R is the first part. Now let's come to the second part. This is again very easy. Please tell me. We earn interest, whatever the fund amount is, whatever the fund balance is, we earn interest on in that. Tell me, this happened in previous year 23-24. Mr. A was working as a CEO, CFO or any other officer last year also. Please tell me if he is working last year also. Let's say last year also it was the same scenario. It was previous year 22-23. Employer has contributed 12 lakh rupees. Employer has contributed 12 lakh rupees. We understand up to 7.5 lakh it is exempt. 4 lakh 50 thousand was the excess amount last year also. So last year also this amount was taxable under section 1727 in excess of in excess of 7.5 lakh, right? Last year balance was also taxable. Last year also the, the, he must have earned some interest also. It was taxable. See last year balance, last year balance will become the opening balance of this year also. So this year, will we be earning interest only on this amount which has been contributed this year or on the opening balance also? So on the opening balance also, whatever was the excess amount, we will earn the interest also. And should we take average or because that is an opening balance, so we should take for the entire year, right? So whatever is the excess contribution last year, we have to take that also. And may, might be he was working earlier year also, previous year, 21, 22 also he might be earning uh, earning this, the same, let me tell you, the let, let me keep it simple, the same amount he was earning that year also. So last to last year also it was 4.5 lakh excess. So that was also the part of the opening balance. So whatever the excess amount of the previous preceding years, we have to take that also and apply that rate of interest, not on average, but on the entire amount. Right, but because this amendment was there from the previous year 22, uh, sorry, 2020, 21 onwards, so you should can go maximum up to previous year 2021, not beyond that, because that amendment came in previous year 2021. Right, so we have to add, we have to add that we will earn interest on such excess also, such excess also, which had happened in the preceding years preceding years, but please don't go beyond 1 for 2020 because this amendment was not there, right? And one more thing, now the last thing, I mean, I'm, I'm going uh, on uh, one more detail, I'm just stepping down to one more detail. Please tell me if this excess amount was contributed last year or last to last year also, whether some interest was earn on such excess also in last year, last to last year also. Yes, sir, that interest would have been taxable under 17 to 7A in those years also. So that amount will also form part of the opening balance. So we have to add not only that excess amount, also the interest earned on such excess amount also will be the part of my opening balance. So not only the excess amount which was contributed last year, also the interest earned on such excess amount. So also the interest which was taxable in the preceding years under section 17 to 7a because that will also be the part of my opening balance. I have to take that also into rate of return, into rate of return, right? So this is the formula over here. This is how this formula is derived. I believe this is clear to you. So it says taxable per user is equal to 
PC upon to into R. This is for the current year. Whatever the excess amount which is contributed during the current year, you have to take the average of it divided by 2 into R. Got it? Plus, this was your opening balance because last year, last to last year, preceding that year also, there was there might be some excess. So that this is PC1. It was the excess of the preceding years. But please don't go before 1 for 2020. And what is TP1? TP1 was the annual accretion on that particular excess which had happened last year so last year last year so this amount was the part of opening balance please apply the rate of return also so you understand tp here is taxable per user under section 17 to 7a so how much we would be taxing this year so it depends is there any excess if there is any excess just divide it by two because you have to take the average so pc upon two what is pc employer contribution in excess of 7.5 lakh in the current previous year that is why you are taking average into R is rate of return or rate of interest you can say plus PC1 plus TP1. What is PC1? PC1 was the excess contribution of last year, last to last year, last to last year but please don't go beyond 1 for 2020. So employer contribution in excess of 7.5 lakh in the preceding previous years commencing on or after 1 April 2020 please don't go before that and also what is TP1? Aggregate of taxable per user in a 17-7a of those preceding years because that is now the opening balance. So apply on this, apply the rate of return or rate of interest. So you will get how much is the annual expiration. This would also be taxable. Rate of return would be given to you. Otherwise, can we calculate rate of return also? Yes, we can calculate. How? Let's say if I tell you, I just tell you, I, I, I'm giving a simple example. Let's say of any fund, any fund, the opening balance is, let's say 7 lakh rupees, right? The opening balance is 7 lakh rupees. During the year also, some amount is contributed to this fund. And the closing balance becomes, closing balance becomes 10 lakh rupees. So in the beginning, it was 7 lakh. During the year, you have contributed some 3 lakh rupees, the closing balance become 10 lakh. And if I say in this year, in this year you have earned rupees 1 lakh, you have earned rupees 1 lakh, right? So how much is this you have earned, let's say you have earned interest of 1 lakh. So tell me how much is the interest rate? So you, you will say sir 1 lakh is earned on the 7 lakh also and during the year also some amount is contributed, at the end it comes to 10 lakh rupees right so what is the rate of interest interest amount is 1 lakh so you will say so this interest is earned on this average balance this average balance so what is the average balance this is the same like you do the same thing in your financial management also rate of return return on capital employed and where you take opening capital closing capital or average capital so we take average capital also sometimes same way we have to calculate the rate of return so the return is 1 lakh so 1 lakh is Earn on how much amount? So we will take 7 lakh plus 10 lakh, that is 17 lakh divided by 2, average is 8.5 lakh. So 1 lakh is earned on 8 lakh 50,000. So tell me this is our 1 lakh is the interest earned, 8 lakh 50,000 is the average balance. So you can say the rate of return is 1 lakh divided by 8 lakh 50,000. It is 11.76 percent. Right. So this is how the rate of return would be calculated, although it will not come in examination, but you should know. This is how rate of interest is. It might be it. They might give you directly also, but if they are not giving you directly, you can calculate this also. Rate of interest is I upon FAVG. FAVG is nothing but the opening balance of the fund and closing balance of the fund. You take the average of it divided by 2. 7 lakh plus 10 lakh divided by 2, 8.5 lakh. I is the annual accretion, whatever is the income which you have earned during the year, right? So we have earned 1 lakh divided by 8.5 lakh, we got 11.76 or 7, yes, 76%. 7, so that is the rate of return. Got it? This is how this formula is derived. You must have learned this formula earlier, but you should know how this formula is derived. Got it? Okay, so this was about provident fund. So let's come to Agnivir Corpus Fund. You understand there, there is a scheme of central government now uh, that the youth who are uh, between the age of 17 to 22, they can apply uh, to become the soldier. They have an opportunity to serve the Indian Defense Forces, Army, Navy, Air Force for five years. And uh, 
out of those people 25 percent would be retained and 75 percent would be um retired from that and they can start their uh, later on they can start their own business or that five years because they have already served in the indian army they have developed so much skills they have developed uh in their personality also there is so much of grooming which had happened so they have a lot of opportunity so it's a very uh fantastic scheme which has been uh, launched by the central government so in that scheme they they are saying that for for five years you will be getting salary also and every month the salary which you will receive 30 percent will be deducted and will be uh, deposited in agnivir corpus fund so they have uh, come out with a fund which is known as agnivir corpus fund so employee that is the soldier that is agnivir agnivir will deposit it will deposit he will not actually uh, himself deposit government will deduct from salary and they will deposit that is called employee contribution to Agnivir Corpus Fund and the same amount 30 percent of their salary will be deposited extra over and above their salary government will also deposit it deposit central government will also deposit that we can say employer contribution so employer contribution because government is depositing extra so that amount will belong to Agnivir that soldier so whenever he will be retired from this um, his position he will get this amount. So this is again an amount which is deemed to be received, right? So whatever government will contribute, that will become his income. That will become his income as a part of gross salary. So whatever employer contribution to Agnivir Corpus Fund, employer contribution here, the employer would be central government. So whatever is the central government contribution, that will become their income, right? Please add them in the gross salary. And then after that, there is a deduction available under section Chapter 6, 80 CCH is a new section which was introduced. I'll uh, discuss that also in detail under the chapter of deductions. So there is again two deductions, 80 CCH 1 and 80 CCH 2. Whatever employee is contributing, that is his investment. He's eligible to get this deduction under section 80 CCH. Whatever employer is contributing, please first make it income. Then deduction is under 80 CCH 2, that is employer contribution. So he can claim deduction of 80 CCH 2 also. And if the SSE is following new tax regime, that is default tax regime, 80 CCH2 is only available. Not 80 CCH1, only 80 CCH2 is available. But if the SSE is following default tax, uh, sorry, optional tax regime, then both the 80 CCH1 and 80 CCH2 deduction would be available. That I will talk about um, in our deduction chapter. So this is about Agnivir Corpus Fund. Whatever the employer is contributing, first of all, you have to make the income of, uh, you have to make income under the head salary. Right. Then later on, ATCCH1, CCH2 is available. CCH2 is available under both the scheme. CCCH1 is available only under optional tax regime. Right. Okay. So let's come to another retrenchment compensation and VRS, although not very important from the examination point of view. But yes, you never know. Sometimes examiner can ask some uh, points about these provisions also. So retrenchment compensation, retrenchment compensation means uh, if uh, they are laying off some of the employees or the employers, businesses getting shut down, then if they are paying retrenchment compensation to the employee, so that compensation is covered under the head salary. It is called as the profit in lieu of salary, but it is not fully taxable. It could be exempt up to a certain extent. How much it is exempt? So first out of these three limits, least of the following, one is actual retrenchment compensation. Second is rupees 5 lakh. Please remember this statutory amount rupees 5 lakh. Fixed amount rupees 5 lakh or 15 by 26. Almost same as the gratuity, the, pe the people who are covered under payment of gratuity. It is same as them, that 15 by 26 into average salary of last three months. So you have to take the average salary of last three months. What would be the components of the salary? Components of the salary would be basic salary, DA, all taxable allowances and perquisite. All taxable allowances and perquisites are also included over here. But it will not include your bonus, employer contribution to any retirement benefits, gratuity, etc. It will not include retirement benefits. But yes, it will include your basic salary, DA, all taxable allowances and perquisites, right? Okay, 15 by 26 into average salary of last three months and complete year of service or part thereof in excess of six months. You understand what is in excess of six months now, right? If it is in excess of six months, then you have to go to the next figure. So whatever is the least amount, you have to give the exemption of this amount. Similarly, in case of VRS, if a person is taking a 
voluntary retirement before the age of superannuation if the uh, person is taking a voluntary retirement let's say the superannuation age in his organization is 60 years and right now he's just 54 years and he would like to take a vrs if company allows then they can he can take a vrs and some amount will be given to him so the amount which he has received it is called as profit in lieu of salary under section 17 3 we see that that this is profit in lieu of salary but yes it could be exempt up to certain extent how much it could, would be exempt so uh, actual amount which he has received the actual compensation or vrs amount which he has received or rupees 5 lakh again there here also the limit is 5 lakh 3 into your salary into only complete year of service you have to take you have to take uh, part of the year if it is let's say 9 years 11 months so you have to ignore those 11 months only complete year should be taken 3 into salary here salary means your rbs salary your last drawn rbs salary in rbs salary you understand we take only basic salary da forming part plus fixed percentage commission on turnover only last month last drawn salary you have to take three into salary into complete years or salary that is same last month salary rba salary into number of months remain remaining for the services what is the number of months remaining in the services let's say i have given you the example let's say the retirement normal retirement is 60 years right now is 54 years so how much is the remaining years which was left still it was six years into 12 that is 72 years sorry 72 months which is left that is the remaining month so whatever is the salary of the last drawn salary rps into the number of months which are left in his service this is how you will lease on the four you will be exempting it and over and above you will you can tax that amount so this was all about retirement scheme there is also a very small concept like profit in lieu of salary and I think we have already discussed so many things which are covered in the profit and lieu of salary. Whenever you receive the taxable portion of retrenchment compensation or VRS, this, this is called profit and lieu of salary. This is something which you are receiving, receiving over and above your salary. That is the reason we are calling it as a profit and lieu of salary. Even your amount of gratuity, pension, this is nothing but like a profit in lieu of salary because this is something which you are receiving over and above your salary. So this is called profit and lieu of salary. One of the important components of profit and lieu of salary is Key man insurance. What is key man? Key man is a very important person who is working in our organization and we believe that this person has a lot of importance in our organization. If he will not be there, then we can suffer losses. We can suffer losses or the company will not be able to earn that much profit which they were making if that this person is working with us. So what does company do? Uh, these employer take a insurance on this key man that if something will happen to the key man, then they can get some insurance amount. So this amount belongs to whom? This amount belongs to whenever they receive the compensation, uh, the insurance claim amount. This amount is uh, the property of this. It's the owner. The owner of this amount would be the employer because we know the thumb rule. The person who pays the premium, the person who pays the premium. And in that case, if insurance company gives back the claim, then the claim belongs to that person who pays the premium. So who was paying the pre premium for key man insurance? The company the employer so this amount if some uh, if uh, something happens to this scheme and if this amount is received by the employer it becomes employer income and we will cover this under the head pgbp so because now employer is getting this income it would be covered under pgbp but let's say employer says no no i don't want to keep this money let me give it to the employee let me give it to the employee so if they are giving it to the employee it will become employee's salary income right let's say it might happen that the employee has died, has died, and employer has received this scheme and insurance amount. If say employer says no, we are not keeping it with us. Let us give this amount to their family members. So if they give the scheme and insurance amount to the family members, it becomes their IFOS. So we read this scheme and insurance uh, at three places. One is in salary. If the employee receives it, then salary. If the employer receives it, then it becomes your PGBP income, and if the uh, any other family member or other person receives this it becomes their ifos right so this scheme and insurance also is also a part of profit in lieu of salary amount received before taking up the employment or after termination of the employment this is again profit in lieu of salary before taking uh, up employment for example joining bonus let's say there is a person who is very much skillful and some company, other company uh, came to know that this person has so much of qualification. He's such a skillful person. Let us hire him. So they offer him 
a certain salary that person says no i am okay with my current employer i don't want to join your company but that company says okay please join us and we will give you 10 lakh rupees as a jo joining bonus so he says okay now it is fine give me 10 lakh rupees so the 10 lakh rupees which he has got over and above his salary that is nothing but profit in lieu of salary it is also called a, uh, called as joining bonus right so these all things are profit in lieu of salary okay now the last part is relief under section 89 so what is relief under section 89 so it happens sometimes that if uh, employee receives any area of salary it happens generally when employer increases certain component of your salary let's say your da let's say employer increases your da he says that you are receiving 10000 rupees per month da let us in, let, let us uh, increase by another 10000 now your new da is 20000 rupees okay you will feel very happy that your da is increased now you will get 10000 rupees more per month and again he will make you more happier why he he says that we are giving a retrospective effect we are giving a retrospective effect from the last year last year also you have received da of 10000 rupees per month we are making it 20 so you will get 1 lakh 20000 rupees which are which were related to last year but you will receive it in this year because you you were uh, you were not knowing it that whether you will be receiving it or not in the last year but this year you are quite surprised and you are very much happy that you have received this excess amount that is nothing but arrears of salary and we know that if arrears of salary was not taxable in any other year and whenever you will receive it it will be taxed in this year so we will be taxing 1 lakh 20000 rupees this year so you are happy uh, that you have received uh, an increase in da from this year also and for the earlier also you have received 1 lakh 20000 rupees extra you have to pay tax this this year but then you realize that because i am i am getting that 1 lakh 20000 which was related to some year i am getting it in this year and it was not taxed earlier but i am happy that i have received this but at the same time employee is quite sad because he thinks that he has to give something extra extra tax he has to give why he says he claims that if employer if you would have given this 1 lakh 20000 rupees extra da in the last year itself my tax liability would have been a little lower it was less it should, it would have been less but now my uh, tax liability is increased before because of this da so if this is the case if his 1 lakh whatever the da if, in my example it was 1 lakh 20000 if this da or any other amount which he has received as arrears of salary and for and for that reason he has to pay some extra tax so whatever the extra tax which he has to pay we will give them a relief under section 89 and it is very easy to calculate first of all step 1 says step 1 says that first of all we will calculate this uh, for, for, uh, we will calculate your tax taking into account your entire income of this year so whatever income which you have received including that area first of all compute your tax liability okay step 1 we can easily compute the tax liability of the current year including that da step 2 say okay exclude that areas exclude that da uh, or exclude that areas then compute your tax liability of the current year okay we will exclude it and we will calculate the tax liability then they will say deduct step 1 minus step 2 we will get step 3 what is this step 3 this is the tax on that area this is the tax on that area in our case tax on that 1 lakh 20000 rupees got it so you will get to know how much tax i am paying on this area the same thing the same steps you have to repeat for that year to which such area relates let's say this area was related to last year so in step number 4 you have to calculate the tax of last year including that area okay i'll calculate the tax including that area step 5 exclude that area and calculate the tax of the last year okay i'll calculate it difference of step 4 minus step 5 so this will again will give you the tax liability on that particular area which would have been the last year let's say this difference of current year was let's say rupees 40000 was the tax on that area and in step 6 if this area would have been received last year let's say the tax is 30000 so you will say see i have to pay 10000 rupees more because you are paying me you are taxing that area in this year so if employee is getting any hardship over here we will give them a relief this year so how much relief will be provided 40000 minus 30000 Ten thousand is the relief. So this is step number seven. Ten thousand is the relief which would be provided. But yes, if this difference is forty thousand, 
and if we will see the difference of last year, if, if this was also 40,000, it means that there is no need to give any relief because there is no hardship on the employee, right? You can also ask me, sir, here if the difference is 40,000 and if we will see the last year difference is 45,000. So is there any hardship? No, now the employee is getting benefit. So we, should we give a relief or should we take something more? No, in that case, we will do nothing. There will be no relief provided because there is no excess, right? There is no excess, there is no hardship. And what will happen to that 5,000 excess extra amount? Nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. There would be no relief in that case. Relief will only be there if something, if the hardship is on the employee. And if there is no hardship, then there will be no relief which will be provided to the employee, right? So this was about... Uh, the chapter salary salary chapter is although quite voluminous but it is not difficult it is not at all difficult because just you have to uh, take extra care uh what was the salary what's the meaning of salary in different scenarios so that is the reason i have given you this book so that you can easily uh see i have taken some classes some revision classes this is i think the fourth class for salary but if you will now revise it by just looking at your book, which I have given it to you, you would hardly take half an hour to revise the entire salary. But at the same time, it is very important. Every time I ask you to please practice your questions, please practice your questions, keep on practicing your, especially, first of all, please give the priority to the questions which are on, at the back of your book, of your, I'm talking about the, uh, about your study material. So whatever the practice questions are given in your study material, Please give it utmost priority. Please uh, solve them. I will urge you to solve them by writing. By writing, you should solve them. And then uh, it should be your past year papers, your RTPs, at least three to four RTPs of last past years. You should do some RTPs. If the time permits, uh, you can do three or four. And even if uh, you are short of, you're running short of time, at least one or two RTPs you should do. And same goes with mock test paper. If you have ample time, I would suggest you to at least five to six mock test paper. And if you are running short of time, at least one or two. But the priority should be, first of all, you should uh, be through with all the questions which are at the back of the chapter of your study material, then your past year questions, then your RTPs, then your MTPs. And how uh, uh, depends upon how much time you are left with, please do it accordingly. But it is very important to practice. Okay. So uh, this is the end of revision chapter of salary and now we will be continuing in um, our next revision lecture. Uh, the next chapter is cost property. Till then, take care and bye-bye.